They haven't returned a dispatch in weeks. They're swamped. We'll never get an answer in time. Just like the ancients used it. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will cover everything known about the Lasat species, getting into some of the deepest lore there is with a connection to the Celestials. Those ancients that were to shape the solar systems and cut off areas of the galaxy by manipulating nebulas and black holes. The Lasat story begins at grid coordinates 020 in wild space, on the world of Lirasan, with neighbors like Dagobah and Utapau. This world is a mix of deserts and savannas, which help shape the beings we see today, long ears for heat dissipation, and picking up any sounds in this dangerous world. They were carnivores that would hunt at night, explaining their enormous eyes, and their fur wasn't as thick as Wookiees, but just thick enough to protect them from the rapid drop in temperature once that sun sunk beneath the horizon, without being too thick to give them a heat stroke during the day. And this is likely why it tapers off towards their head with those large energy demanding brains. Just because they have a flat nose with slits doesn't mean they have a bad sense of smell, it may just be optimized for this environment, as we see with other mammals which have similar noses and still have a great sense of smell. Overall, their look is a mix of monkey and bat, which hints that they may take shelter off the ground in trees and caves, using their muscular hands and feet with long fingers and toes to climb around. The modern Lasat stands at a height of 2 meters, putting them above a human but a bit shorter than a Wookiee, while the largest bat on Earth has a wingspan of 5 foot 6 inches. They have purple, white, and black fur that is short in length but did grow out longer as beards on the males. The pattern in their fur is like a tiger's stripes, more evidence that they evolved in jungles and tall grasses. The society was held together by long-standing oral traditions, powerful mythologies, and an emphasis on prophecy, seeing the hero's journey as a scalable truth of the galaxy, with archetypes that could be seen in an individual's own life, but you'd also notice them in the actions of a tribe as a whole, the drama between tribes, and all the way up to natural phenomena and the galaxy at large. After millennia as tribal nomads, they started to develop a simple hieroglyphic script, built mud brick cities, and these city-states would often be at war with each other, all led by their own hereditary religious figures, monarch theocracies that would have their will enforced by the warrior police caste. And they were so honor-bound that they would only use a person's pronouns as an insult, always choosing to call them by their proper name. Some of these warriors would work as mercenaries for other city-states to help in their wars, and you'll see in a bit how their warlike nature may have resulted in them being isolated from the galaxy as a whole. According to the Lasat from Lasan, they always claim that the first of their people to go off-world only did so because of alien slavers that came and kidnapped them, and they have no memory of the true origins on Lirasan. They also have no native spacefaring tech, and were a much simpler society, but it's also never explicitly said that the Lirasan society created space travel either. It could be that a third-party alien race captured a great number of them to act as slaves on Lasan. And once these two populations were established, at some point a star cluster imploded and created a nebula that cut off the Lirasan star system. This made me think of what we see on the planet Kobo in Jedi Survivor. There is this nebula anomaly, and in the trailer, Cal says this. And I think we finally found somewhere the Empire can't reach us. Imagine. No more looking over your shoulder. A place that's worth fighting for. Not saying that Cal will go to the Lirasan system, just pointing out that this tactic could have been used throughout galactic history to protect yourself from the terrors that come from space. Isaac Arthur's channel has a great video on one of the potential answers to the Fermi Paradox. The idea that if the universe is so large and old, and life arises naturally, where are all the alien civilizations? One answer is that when a civilization develops tech for advanced space travel, they start to realize how advanced other aliens might be. They see the power gap between them and ants, and start to worry how advanced other alien species might be compared to them. So they use their tech to try and hide themselves. In the galaxy far, far away that has had galactic-scale warfare from several different factions for millennia, you could see why a civilization would really want to hide. The Chiss lived in the maze that was the Unknown Regions, requiring them to use Force-sensitive navigators called Skywalkers, and automated drones that would map out and establish a network of anchor points. You would have to make short jumps through space in order to make it through this maze. And Exegol was protected by the Veil that would destroy any explorer, requiring the Sith that cherished this world to use a Wayfinder, a mystical technology that was shaped like a Sith holocron, likely meant to show its connection to the dark side of the Force, which was necessary to unlock the mysteries of Exegol. Most refer to this protective veil as a natural barrier, but it's possible that this was a creation of ancient Sith lords. Imagine some primitive people thinking how lucky it was that a castle was protected by its own river. We know that that's a man-made moat for defensive purposes. And places, like Gobekli Tepe, are believed to have been intentionally buried to hide it. 
I think many of the so-called natural barriers that we're seeing in both Legends and even now in canon are the results of a long-lost, high-tech, force-wielding people. And that describes the Celestials also known as the Architects, and later we see them as the Ones. They're credited with forming the Corellian System, Voltar System, Hapes Cluster, which is another system that was hidden within a nebula, and the same story with the Cathal Rift, while the most dramatic example was the Maw Black Hole Cluster. That's the Maw. The description of the most dangerous section of the Maw says that it was, quote, saturated in radiation, plasma, and strong gravitational forces. Any ship's captains that neared the edge of the mall would notice pieces of the ship being pulled apart, which is exactly what happens when trying to visit Lyrasan. It is believed that the Celestials merged themselves with the Force eons before even the Old Republic, and this is what we see when we find the Ones on Mortis, potentially the Living Force planet as well, with Mortis being the best example of a hidden location being outside of space-time. The original Lyrasan people could have been in communion with these alien gods, guiding these people, setting up culture, and preserving rituals to respect the prophecies and that theocracy with their connection to the Force. Like we see with the Skywalker family, Force traits are highly heritable, and the Celestials may have helped them set up their colony on Lasat before they decided to collapse their star and create this seemingly natural cover. The best way to hide something isn't to put big orbital cannons, but to make it impossible for an enemy to navigate or even consider that something could be inside of the nebula. We know that the Lasat had a connection to the same Force tradition that is spread across the entire galaxy in ancient times. By the Ashla, the prophecy! With the early Jedi Order calling the light side the Ashla and the dark side the Bogan, the Bendu referred to the Force as the Ashla. Jedi and Sith wield the Ashla and Bogan, the light and the dark. I'm the one in the middle, the Bendu. As does the mystic, prophecy-obsessed Lasat Chava the Wise. She was a member of the Reverend Masters, and she carries an Ashla staff. This staff and the bow rifle carried by the High Honor Guard are a lot like a lightsaber. Just as the saber was tied to the Jedi and useful for certain trials in the Jedi Temples, testing your connection to the Force, the staff and bow rifle channel the Force in a way similar to a kyber crystal. For all we know, there is something like kyber tech inside. Because while it's described as an electrostaff, this could just be a simplification for the types of plasma it emits. Essentially, a lightsaber is plasma, and there are big plasma cutters, but that's still not a lightsaber. And these bow rifles were only made by a Lasat company. They are similar, but still very different from a standard electrostaff. And the fact that it can be used for navigation is something that's so alien to the Jedi Order Force tech of this era, something that seems more obscure and like an ancient Force tradition that was lost during the Old Republic era. There's also the fact that the Celestials wipe memories. If there is to be balance, what you have seen must be forgotten. This could explain how they lost all memory of their true homeworld. Collapsing stars in just the right way to create a nebula that safely envelops you without destroying your solar system would be one of the most advanced acts ever seen in the galaxy, something only the Celestials could have done. And it's not like the Lasat were a ridiculously advanced species. You could argue that their force powers were so strong that they found a way to protect themselves from the natural collapse of the stars, but that road still leads to the Celestials, as even the Jedi Order was greatly influenced by them. I have an old video explaining this connection from everything to Ilum and various temples around the galaxy that were so old that the Jedi assumed they built them, but they're all covered in symbols that are only seen on Mortis. Perhaps there is something in the Lyrason system that is so important to the Force that the Celestials wanted to quarantine it. They are said to have created the hyperspace disturbances that make it hard to get in and out of the unknown regions, and even put essentially a wall around the galaxy. That's why I like to think of the Celestials as playing some sort of game with sentient life in the galaxy, creating little experiments within this galaxy, allowing enormous sections to mingle, while cutting off other enormous sections, while others are just stuck in a single star system. While they also maintain the Force itself, and are always watching like a scientist as different cultures and Force traditions arise. It's one of the deepest parts of the lore, as you can think of our galaxy working like this too. Explaining different ages, like giants and monsters, magic and miracles that seemed more common in the past, and how they viewed the world was so incredibly different from moderns. And we can never explore certain spots of the universe, because the universe itself is expanding faster than the speed of light. I highly suggest you watch this video. It ends with a really terrifying point that billions of years from now, the light from the rest of the universe wouldn't be detectable. So the best scientists of the day would think that their galaxy was the only thing in the entire universe, and that it always existed like this. The true past would not be observable. The only way they could know is if their people maintained a record of the findings from the past. 
and they would also have to believe that these ancient scientists were accurate in what they were seeing. So just like how the Lasat living on Lasan may have had their minds wiped, if the Celestials really wanted this to be like a bubble universe unaffected by the galaxy at large, they might have wiped the minds of those living on the Rasan as well. And their top scientists may feel that the walls of the nebula are the true edge of the universe. Now we also have to consider the fact that the Lasat may have been the problem, and the rest of the galaxy needed to be quarantined from them. With their intense martial tradition, clearly advanced control over the Force, and an almost Mandalorian belief that might makes right, like how a Darksaber must only go to the strongest, Only the strongest shall rule. Zeb tells Kallus about their warrior tradition to give over this Force-connected holy weapon just because someone beat them in combat. With Busan Kira in the Sot warrior way, when one is defeated by a superior foe, he gets his weapon. Only the Lasat of the High Honor Guard were given these weapons, but apparently they saw some deep cosmic meaning in defeat. The idea that the bow rifle should only be in the hands of the strongest warriors. No concept of good or evil. And so it's interesting to think that the Lasat could have been the threat, like force-wielding Mandos threatening the galaxy in some long lost time. The Celestials may have helped them with their force connection, preventing a situation like we saw with the Qua and Rakata. I know that's a massive lore bomb, so let me know what you think down in the comments. But getting back into their timeline, there were slavers that attacked early Lasan that found that despite these being simple people having no space travel or advanced cities, and getting most of their food from just trapping animals, somehow these primitive people had a mastery of chemistry, and when enslaved were known to make explosives from common chemical agents, which quickly put an end to the Lasat slave trade. By the time of the Clone Wars, there was at least one Lasat Jedi Master, Jaro Tapal, who took Cal Kestis as his Padawan. He would die helping Cal escape during Order 66, and it wasn't long before the Empire came to Lasan. Early on in the Imperial Era, a Lasat mercenary working with Saul Guerrera attacked the forces under the command of Agent Callus. The Lasat calmly walk through smoke and fire to finish my unit off one by one. Though I do doubt it was in direct retaliation to that particular merc, the Empire did invade Lasan. And as if to conduct a sick experiment, a stress test to push the T7 ion disruptor to its limits, the Empire sent down shuttles full of troopers armed with this unique weapon. It was designed for an anti-vehicle role, a portable way to shoot down aircraft, disable enemy vehicles, and override shields. Its ion bolt was so powerful that it caused a chain reaction that when applied to organics would separate bonds at an atomic level. It's said to be one of the most painful ways to die in the entire galaxy, and it's this battle that convinced the Imperial Senate to ban their use. There was a long cool-off and recharge time between shots compared to a normal blaster rifle, which makes this massacre of the Lasat people even more horrific as the Empire opened fire on anything that moved, but it would all be so deliberate, not mowing them down with automatic fire, but with tons of time in between shots to hear the screams before a trooper picked out and isolated the next individual to fire on. One of the things the Imperial Overseers were happy to see is that a single bolt had a charge that was so powerful that it could jump from one body to another if the target was close enough, like a mother clinging to her child. The Honor Guard must have been able to put up a decent fight even against these weapons, maybe grabbing some and using them against the imps, because this battle ends with a series of bombings. Zeb says that he didn't even see it go off, that one moment he was fighting, and the next memory he had was waking up in rubble, with no survivors in sight. As far as he knew, he was the last surviving Lasat in the galaxy. I was responsible for protecting the royal family, and every single Lasat. Their safety was my duty. We held the palace. And then, there was a bomb, and when I woke up, it was all just gone. We retreated. I was as good as dead. At least until Kanan found me, they called me Captain. I don't deserve to be called that! I failed my people that day. Eager to join the fight against the Empire, he was a proud member of the Spectres, and years later he finally came across other survivors. My people... Lasat. Though when she starts to talk prophecy, we see that he had grown cynical of these old traditions, which didn't provide any help the day the Empire showed up. Gron reveals that he once served under Zeb in the Honor Guard, likely surviving under the rubble as well. But since then, he no longer believes that they should fight back. Do not fight. It is no longer our way. Your Lasat, your warriors, of course you fight! 
For a proud warrior people that respected combat so much they gave over their sacred weapon to a stronger foe, this way of thinking was revolutionary. But Zeb eventually had to respect the ritual. The time has come to prepare the ritual that will guide us to our new home. An interesting side note is that Chava does understand Chopper, so their people do not avoid droids like some other species. I'm not weird! The mystic explains one of their oldest tales of the three archetypes. The fool, simple and selfish. He would lead the warrior, bold and bloodthirsty, to hunt the hope of tomorrow. The child, to destroy him! With the ritual performed, and again, this can only work through some interaction with the Force, she tells Zeb that they must combine their staffs. Your bow rifle as the ancients used it. Now that the location of their world was revealed, Hera is quick to plot the jump, unaware of this celestial roadblock. What's wrong? There's something in our path. Imploded star cluster, biggest one I've ever seen. Our course is blocked by the worst kind of space anomaly we could have encountered. Ah, this is the maze that was prophesized. Hondo's tracker allowed the Empire to follow right behind them, and we see that Zeb is still upset that he is not the warrior that at this time, Agent Callus is playing that archetypal role. But she reassures him that life has us playing many roles when the time is right. He is the warrior, and I got stuck being the child? You are never one of these. In time, you become all of them. Zeb finally accepts his role in this moment, and as if a muse of the Force speaks in his mind, he knows to use its bow rifle and its ancient mythological purpose. Just like the ancients used it. Even Hera has no idea what he's doing, or how this is piloting her ship. Those beams are interacting with the Force, and this is why Kanan and Ezra put their hands on him to strengthen his connection to the Force, or Ashla. Somehow these bolts of plasma are negating the electrogravitic effects of the nebula. I don't know how, but the hyperdrive is activating! Notice that this hyperspace is different than normal, not just pure blue, but now with purple hues pointing again to something unique, and a combination of extreme high-tech and force powers. There are already Lassat down there. Lyrasan is where my people originally came from. Consider this system charted, which means now that the ghost has been here, we can always come back. How could they always come back here when they want to? It can't mean that they could just pop in and out of the safe area now that they had the coordinates, because they had the coordinates via the ritual. They were on their way through normal hyperspace when they were ripped out by the nebula. I think this has to point to an intelligent reaction by the Ashla or Lassat on world. It can't be some device because the ghost stays off world. They don't dock anywhere or land. They only know that there are people on Lyrasan after Zeb tells them. So no Lyrasan tech was physically added to the ship. It could be that the Lassat are actively controlling this nebula and thus can form some lane for the ship. But how could they know when the specters are coming? Calms in and out of here are likely impossible with normal technology, and again, Hera is saying this without receiving any new tech. I think it's something that Kanan must have told her. He must have sensed that this was a force anomaly, hiding in the form of a natural phenomena, that the Ashla was now open to them. The ones were dead, whatever that might mean for them. At the very least, they're in a time of great change. So whatever the original reason was to hide these people, those conditions have changed as well. Later, years into Kallus' service to the Rebellion, fighting to right the wrongs he committed in a life of service to the Empire, he would accept Zeb's invite, acting like the archetypal child, reborn without the preconceived notions and hatred of Imperial ideology, his Lassat friend brings him to Lyrasan so that the human can see for himself that he did not exterminate these people, that they were thriving and welcoming to even him. While the Lassat's role in the galaxy at large will be fascinating to explore, and we need to remember their story when we try to understand the galaxy as a whole. How entire systems could be hidden by ancient alien gods, and the many mysterious ways the Force expresses itself. That's it for the breakdown, and as for behind the scenes facts, the bow rifle makes a trident shape like the ancient mythological device found all over the world. This is an enormous rabbit hole that is fascinating to explore. Sometimes called the Vajra or Double Trident, it's a powerful device used by the gods and speculated to be some lost advanced technology. Like the bow rifle, one of these ideas is that it emits plasma. Here are some ways that that shape is formed by plasma discharges, so it could be something as some ancient novelty that was wielded by kings to woo the people, while other theories go full advanced super weapon tech. The interpretation I like the most is that it's the squatting man seen in the sky, recorded in artwork all over the world, and could be an enormous plasma discharge in the sky during surges of cosmic radiation, often accompanying natural disasters. 
and so this could have been interpreted as a giant weapon wielded by the gods. Hondo selling the Lasants as slaves may be a reference to that old myth of their origins and legends. And I think that the fact that the lore stresses their odd mastery of chemistry to be a hint to their lost advanced civilization, and it invokes ideas of ancient Egyptian civilizations having a combo of spiritual and technological understanding that is now lost to history, with the word chemistry coming from the word kemet, the native word for what is now called Egypt. The design for the Lasats come from the early concept art for Chewbacca by Ralph McQuarrie, and lore gets expanded on them in Tatooine Manhunt and the Star Wars role-playing game, where they are described as having brown fur, while other details come from the Atlas, Chronology, Alien Encounters, and Encyclopedia. Hitting that like button is the best way to help me out. Comment, share, subscribe, and check out the membership, but most important of all, remember, if you look close enough at any natural phenomena, you'll find the fingerprints of the Force Gods, and the Force will be with you. Always.